blinding moment of clarity to realize who you really are. And who we really are are sinners that didn't deserve the grace of God. Neither did the Apostle Paul. When he says, you know, when the Lord looked at me, I was like a a baby born out of due time. So let's pick on back up and let's look at the Apostle Paul who had been separated from his mother's womb. Yet he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. What that means is, not only is he threatening, hey man, I will knock you on your, f- knock you off your feet if you continue down this path. He was also breathing out slaughters, which means take that man, take him to the high council so he can be executed. The Apostle Paul is actively working against the church of God. Why is he doing that? Well, he tells us a little bit about it in uh, Philippians where he goes through his pedigree. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was, of, uh, he was the most studied person in Judaism, studied under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the leading teachers of the day. So he was a Harvard-educated super Jew. And he's bragging, but you know what he says about that? He says, all this stuff, all my pedigree, all my abilities, I count but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He counted all of his education. He counted his birthright. He said that in keeping of the law, he was blameless. Who among us could say that? Of all the 613 precepts that are contained in the Old Testament law, the Apostle Paul says, I didn't break anything. Paul had so much confidence in his ability because of who he was and because of how he performed. And I am here to tell you today that if you are in a performance-based religion, you are killing yourself. You're not knowing what you're doing. Well, his performance-based religion told him that Jesus wasn't the Christ despite the evidence Despite the resurrection, despite the many miracles that Jesus had done among the Israelite people, his performance-based religion said, it's not that simple. you got to please God by what you do, how you act, what you say. That's how you please God. So, Paul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughterings against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest <clears throat> and desired <clears throat> of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that's Christianity, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Can we just pause real quick and marinate in how much Saul hated Christians? Damascus to Jerusalem is 130 miles So what we've read about previously in the book of Acts is that Saul is trying to stamp out Christianity. But when he did it, it's like a sledgehammer hitting a jello cube. It just splurted out there, and all the Christians fled according to the unction of the Spirit, and they went out. And so Paul's trying to to get them and and, and nail them down, and he's whack-a-moling all the Christians as best he can. So he goes up to Jerusalem, he says, give me letters, and he went as far. It was his intention to go 130 miles. Brothers, sisters, I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't drive 130 miles just because I hated somebody in an air-conditioned car on a freeway. The Apostle Paul didn't have that. The man's going to have to ride a donkey, get in a wooden cart in the middle of a desert road. That's how consumed he was with hatred of Christians. I wonder how God's going to respond to that. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly... I don't know if you mark in your Bibles, but I do. (laughs) And I love whenever I come across the word suddenly. Because that means that, ask not for whom the bell tolls. (laughs) Suddenly, a light came upon him. If you go in your Bibles and you research the word suddenly, what you're going to find out is there's an amazing correlation between the word suddenly in the grace of God, because that's how grace works. It comes suddenly. It doesn't become, it doesn't come to you because, 
on account of, for what you did. It comes suddenly according to an operation of God in His divine plan, in His will in your life, suddenly. When the grace of God and the person of Jesus Christ came to the Apostle Paul at this moment, he had done nothing to deserve it. His pedigree didn't amount for squat. His ability to keep the law didn't amount for squat. He was doing the exact opposite of what a good, quote, good Christian should be doing. He was breathing out threatenings and slaughters, and he was so consumed with hatred that he's willing to take a multi-day journey in the heat of the desert in order to kill them and bring them, or bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's the state of Paul when grace came upon him. Brothers and sisters, that's your state too when grace came to you. When you were born again of the Spirit of God, you were a dead sinner. The Bible uses the term alien sinner. You weren't part of the family of God, but God brought you into His family according to a plan that He had, not because of anything you did, you said, you accepted, or you believed. It's all of God and His love. And it's the same way. Jesus comes to Paul to convert him, and it says, And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I want to pause real quick and point out something to you. How Jesus very closely identifies himself with his church. You cannot ignore this, because the Apostle Paul hadn't persecuted the person of Jesus. He was persecuting the people of Jesus. And when you despise the people and the church of Jesus, you are despising Jesus. When you persecute the people of Jesus, you are persecuting Jesus. Jesus says this himself. Inasmuch as you fed the least of mine, you clothed them, or you visited them in prison, you fed me, you clothed me, and you visited me in prison. Brothers and sisters, you are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. How are we doing? I hope we have a blinding moment of clarity sometimes. And it says, as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling, astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Up until this point, Saul really didn't know the Lord. He, he had ignorantly opposed Christ because he didn't understand who Jesus was. But now in this great encounter, in this revelation, he encounters the very presence and the voice of Jesus on the Damascus road. He can no longer ignore the crucified Jesus whom Saul considered previously as a blasphemer, a heretic, and a dangerous false prophet. He can no longer ignore the crucified Jesus who met, him, uh, who met his end on a Roman cross just a few years before. He can no longer ignore his followers who were claiming that he rose from the dead. Even though he hadn't believed it previously, he thought they were delusional and deceivers. And now everything changes because he knows. He is alive, that means that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And if he really is the Christ, he's the promised Messiah, the prophet, the priest, the king, that the old system and all that Old Testament that Paul had studied about foreshadowed. And I want you to think about this because everything hinges on this. <laughs> everything hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then everything he claimed about himself is true. You have to contend with the facts of the resurrection. And now Paul, Saul comes face to face with the facts of the resurrection. He now comes to realize that Jesus, whom he had opposed and denied, 
is indeed the risen Lord and had been working and, and, and Saul who had been working against him and persecuting the church. In that moment, when the light of heaven blinded him, the voice of Jesus spoke to him, his world came crashing down and all he could do is cry out, what do you want me to do? And when you really understand who Jesus is, that's really the only thing left for us to do. What, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to love the unlovable? <laughs> you, you want me to accept uh, those that other people don't accept? Do you want me to extend forgiveness to people who have hurt me and, and, and abused me? Do you want me to do that, really, Lord? So let's just stop and think for a moment about what Saul had just experienced. He had just seen a great light. He had just heard a voice from heaven, not just any voice, but the very voice of Jesus himself. And and maybe you've never been thrown down with a blinding light, but maybe, and I think for most of us, God has kind of shaken up our circumstances a bit, allowed things in our life to break our homeostasis. Homeostasis is that tendency to try and keep everything about the same. We do that in this building. We try to keep it, you know, about 68 to 70 degrees because we have air conditioning, and when it gets too warm, the AC clicks on to keep it in the 68 to 70 range. We like homeostasis. Humans enjoy homeostasis, but humans don't really grow in homeostasis because we need challenges in our lives, and sometimes God will rock your world to get you out of your homeostasis. He did with the Apostle Paul, and here's why he did it with the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul trusted in himself. The Apostle Paul trusted in his abilities. The Apostle Paul trusted in his pedigree. The Apostle Paul trusted in his understanding of theology. And that's a dangerous thing to trust in yourself and to have confidence, what the Bible says, in the flesh. Because, brothers and sisters, you are not good enough. The Bible says in Proverbs, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You should always have somebody in your life to question you, to say, are you really on the right path? Because even though you feel like you're on the right path, it could be that your heart, the Bible says, is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Might be leading you just askew. And ultimately, the plumb line to determine if you're on the right path is the written Word of God. And so the Apostle Paul, when you looked at the plumb line and tried to measure him out about how he's doing, is so far off base because he thought pleasing God was hating people. He thought pleasing God was performance. He thought pleasing God was in what you do, how you act, what you said. And just like Jesus would tell people, your hearts, uh, you, 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 you outside you are like whited sepulchers, and inside you're filled with dead man's bones. It is possible to have the appearance of religiosity and yet be dead on the inside. That's why we love grace. <laughs> because even though you might be all cleaned up, God's heart is for the eunuch. God's heart are for the people that have been knocked down, kicked down, lost their jobs. They're in an addictive state right now, whether it's pornography or drugs or alcohol. God's heart is for the hurting. And the religious people who don't like the hurting are so far from God's heart, and they are not the hands and feet of Jesus, and they're not doing His job. Well, Paul was one of God's children, caught up in that kind of mindset that really pleasing God is about what you do as opposed to loving Him and loving His people. And then in a blinding moment of clarity on the Damascus Road, Paul has his heart changed. And he says, because he recognized who God was, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Um, (laughs) When you have those moments... It's an amazing thing because you can think everything's going well in your life. It reminds me of a time when I was in law school and had a refrigerator that used to get clogged up with ice. It was one of those old icebox kind of thing. You open the door, it's an icebox thing. And there was just so much ice on it that I decided to take a butcher's knife because I wanted to expedite it, and I'm chipping away. And in my superhuman strength, I penetrate the back wall, and I hit the Freon line, and all the Freon goes away. And so what I had to do was get a new fridge, right? 
And what that required was taking things out of the refrigerator and putting it in the new fridge. And when I did that, it was a horticultural miracle. There were things growing and life forms and fungi that I never knew existed. But when you clean up your life, that's when you really start to see the dirt and the junk. That's why the Apostle Paul would go on later to say, I am the least of the apostles. I I am the chief of sinners. I I look like a, 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 a miscarried fetus on the side of the road. I am hideous before God. When you are in the most danger for self-righteousness is when you're like, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I got it going on. Yeah, God is really pleased with me. Brothers and sisters, God's not pleased with you. He's pleased with Jesus Christ. And so to the degree that you are able to see that it's all about Christ is the degree that you're closer to the heart of God. And so here Paul is, and he falls down on the ground, and he asks a pivotal question. Lord, what would you have me do? It's a question that every single one of us should ask. Lord, who out there, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord, notice he didn't say, who are you? He knew instantly. He was a child of God, born again. He already knew. He just wasn't living life the way he was supposed to. What will you have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Again, one of these things, the Lord doesn't give us a lot of details when he puts a call on our life. And sometimes it's just an unction of the Spirit. Speak to this person. Well, what do you want me to say? Just speak to the person. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So Saul, one of the more accomplished people in his day, a man who was a leader, was now being led (laughs) Uh, and very dependent on other people at this point. He was used to leading, and now he's being led. And so his world, his homeostasis, got interrupted. And there's a way to understand what happens to us when our world gets rocked. It involves generally four dimensions, if you want to think about it this way, (coughs) two of which (coughs) you're going to experience every single day. The first dimension is the the me, and and I'm very concerned about me. I feed myself, I clothe myself, I make sure there's nothing in my teeth when I speak to you. But then there's also the world around me, the environment that I live in. And so of the environment that I live in, it can have people that I interact with. And because I interact with people, I comb my hair, I shave, I make sure I wear the right colors, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure. And we all operate in these two dimensions every single day. But then, then something can come along and rock us, knock us down, change and affect our homeostasis. And that enters us into what's called the third dimension. And this is written about, it's kind of an ontological study of being. Um, And that third dimension is referred to as the inner being or the void. And what happens when something comes along to knock us on our feet, whether it's a job loss or a divorce or the death of someone or a diagnosis, what happens on the inside is that void and that feeling, I can't handle it. I am not good enough. I am not strong enough. I'm not worthy. And a lot of people look for a lot of things to fill that void. There's an entire generation that turned to drugs to fill that void. Or sex. Or something else. Some people turn to politics to fill the void, to make it feel like they have some sort of control on the outcome of their lives. But brothers and sisters, the thing that fills the void is this fourth dimension that the Bible is very clear on, and it's called the holy dimension. And holy means really something that is completely other and apart. It's out there. And part of what we were created 
is a God-designed void in our lives that only He can fill. And so the Apostle Paul fell down on his hands and knees. He was blinded, and for three days he was led into Damascus, and for three days he sat there emptied until one of God's children, a man by the name of Ananias, came to him. And God's voice came to Ananias, and he told Ananias, and as opposed to Paul, who had very little detail, God's voice came to Ananias, and he said, Ananias, I'm going to be bringing to you Saul, and I want you to pray for him because he is a chosen vessel to me to take the message to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, Ananias is no fool. (laughs) He had checked his Twitter account, he had seen the news feeds, and he knew that Saul was a man to be feared and reckoned with. And Ananias said, Lord, (laughs) are you sure? Because this guy has threatened all of us, and he's a bad umbre. The Lord said, yeah, he is a chosen vessel unto me. That's a miracle to me. That God would choose a vessel like the Apostle Paul. You know what else is just a miracle to me? That God would choose me or you. None of us are worthy. And it all gets down to grace. That God was in Christ reconciling us to Him and gives us the ministry of reconciliation. So you are the hands and feet of Christ, and as you leave these doors, it's on you to share Jesus with others. And not just the affluent or the people that just look like you, but the people that that challenge the very core of your existence. Those that other people have written off. Drug addicts, transsexuals homosexuals, people that have uh, gone through nasty divorce, adulterers, gamblers, just whatever your issue is, that's your ministry, to let them know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Because God came to someone like Saul and turned him into a Paul. God can come to anybody and turn them into the person that He wants them to be. And when the holy enters into the void, amazing things can happen. And it blew Paul away for the rest of his life to the degree that Paul was willing to die and be crucified himself for the good news of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, you got your mission. You got your reason. If you've been converted, then you got the purpose to go out there and share Jesus. And if you haven't been converted, our prayer for you is that God will show you with blinding clarity exactly what He did for you because of who you are. Media where everything's hunky dory, the cotton's high, mama's good looking, none of that stuff. But who you really are in your secret places that nobody knows about, not even your spouse knows some of the thoughts that you have. That's the person that God loves. That's the person that God redeemed. That's the person that God wants to fill more and more with His Holy Spirit to change you into the person that He has called you to be. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to be a life of ease and comfort, but it does guarantee that you're going to find a peace that passes understanding. There's a book called The Transformative Moment, and it's about a Lutheran minister. <clears throat> it kind of studies in, in this transformative moment that occurs in people's lives, and he does talk about these four precepts of me, the environment, the void, and the holy. And he shares it in a very personal way. It's a transformative moment. And this man used to be a professor of theology at a a very prestigious school. And he was very academically inclined. And he's one of these people that had his chalkboards full of equations and drawings and lines and back and forth, things like that. And people would take his class because it was one of those classes that they had to take. And then one day, as he's driving down the side of the road, he sees a car that has a flat tire, and it's with a young couple. So he says, yeah, I'm going to help him. A little small voice speaks to him. He writes about how he had pulled over, and he was changing the tire when somebody who had never, ever driven sleepy had uh, driven sleepy that day and crashed into the back of the car. 
and he was pinned under the car, and the car literally drug him 20 feet while he was underneath the car, just massively cutting open a lot of his bodies. Um, he was taken to the hospital at that time, and it was a very serious condition because he had massive internal damage. He had broken bones. He was full of abrasions. His daughter says that when he came in, he was completely blue, and that they said that before they could um, start working on some of the bones, they had to start stopping all the bleeding that was going on. Um, but he was very conscious of this as they were rolling him back to the surgery room. And what he writes is that I had in that moment such an overwhelming peace and presence that I felt Jesus. And it was so overwhelming to me that all I could do was just sing, Fairest Lord Jesus. And the doctors and the nurses, out of respect, stopped. And then they started the surgery. And at no moment did I fear that something was going wrong because I felt the presence of one who loved me and had my best interest at heart. He says that after that experience, he never walked the same again. He walked with a hunch. He had a thumb that had been had to be screwed back into that, and he didn't speak again because of some slight neurological damage. But now students didn't take his class because they had to. Now there was a waiting for the class because in class now, instead of trying to explain Jesus academically, he explained Jesus personally because he had personally felt the love of Jesus Christ. He became known as the weeping professor. And people would, uh, his, his colleagues would tease him and say, I think you got a little hit a little too hard on your head. Uh, he started every class after that moment with a prayer, just thanking Jesus for who he was and the love that he was sharing. And his professor colleagues would say, I think you're going a little bit too far. And he would tell them, that's on you, it's not on me, because I love this man who loves me so. And he said that it had a transforming effect in the university because now students who were signing up, not because they had to, but because they wanted to, they would say things like, this is why I came to seminary, because I had an experience with God, and I just need to be able to understand it and talk with somebody who's been through it too. And brothers and sisters, that's your story. You don't have to explain Jesus academically. You don't have to know all the scriptures. All you have to do is say that there is one who loves me and I didn't deserve it and show that love to others who don't deserve it. When we do that, we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to walk with us at Camp Creek Church as we do this and fulfill our mission, give you that chance as we stand and sing hymn number 